Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you and welcome. Uh, those of you who aren't from San Diego, um, welcome to San Diego. We, uh, we timed the rain, especially for you. We had it over with at night. You're going to get a little sunshine and then I encourage you this time of year to run out though and get your sun tanning in uh, quickly. So, um, um, Jesse, thank you for, uh, for the nice introduction and the hard work. Uh, we're pleased to, to host everyone here. Uh, I, I have to admit, and under full disclosure up front, we are not a semantic media wiki company. Um, so if some of you would like to, um, to adjourn and go out and have coffee separately, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this as, in part. I'm going to show you something we have, which is, a, which is, which is very cool stuff. Um, but it's an unabashed commercial. So, um, so I'll show you some technology if you want to tune out. I perfectly understand. Um, but, uh, but Jesse thought it was kind of cool and, and, uh, and that you might find it, find it interesting and, and useful at some point. Um, AI1 is a company that's uh, nine years old. Uh, we were founded in Zurich, Switzerland, um, and with the, uh, the premise to build out the concepts and, and thinking of our mad scientist, Monfred Hofleisch, who believed he figured out how the brain works. Um, and uh, it was a bit of a challenge here in the US. You'd never incorporate a company or start a company at this point, because essentially we were uh, in the research and development phase for about six years. Uh, predominantly what that involved is trying to take concepts and put it on a conventional computing system, in this case a, uh, a, a laptop, um, and, uh, and emulate the, uh, the approach so that we could try it. Uh, once you get something like this done and R&D, uh, it's a little back words from what you're used to starting businesses uh, in the sense that you develop something and then you go try and find out if there's a value proposition. Um, we don't represent that we necessarily have figured out the way the brain works. Um, that's an academic argument with neuroscientists. But what we have got is a, uh, a computing platform and a technology that seems to process information much the same way the brain does. Um, and I'm comfortable saying that as a non-neuroscientist, non-computer scientist, because I've had the technology and I've been working with it now for three years, um, and it does a pretty good job of, of handling information and recognizing patterns, discerning relationships and making associations um, the way the brain does, and so that's why I'm here. Um, it was a long journey. It's been, uh, it's been a difficult and interesting uh, and exciting story from a business point of view. Be happy to share details of that with you later. We have about 165 individual shareholders, um, which is not the normal way to finance a, uh, a new business. Our model is entirely entrepreneurial. So when you work with AI1, you get two things. You get this really interesting technology that does something very much unique. Um, and powerful and useful, and you get a bunch of entrepreneurs, a small team. Uh, we're all guys that have started um, and succeeded and failed uh, more than half a dozen times each. Um, we've done this a bunch of different ways. We're in Berlin, Zurich, and, and uh, down here in La Jolla. Um, we have a partnering business model. We don't build end user applications. We stick to our technology. Uh, we invest in R&D and we try and make it as consumable and easy to use as possible. Um, so it's a very exciting thing if you're, if you're on the tail end of your career like I am. Um, you're, you're not really interested in doing the same old stuff over and over again. Um, you appreciate the value of that, but you want to do things that are exciting and new and work with a lot of new ideas all the time, keep it really fresh. And so selfishly, we've created a business that allows us to do that. Um, you know, I don't know if you've used Prezi before, but um, 
Um, I can show you the paths in this thing, and it says that the paths go in order, but for some reason on my machine this morning, this thing is going in all different directions. <laughs> so I'm going to try and, you know what I'm going to do, hold on. Let's go back to, that's actually the slide that should have come up. Um, we call it biologically inspired intelligence, and I, now I'm doing all kinds of crazy things. Okay, let's try this. You can blame it on the new Mac virus or on your PC. Yeah, it's probably because Jesse went first with a Mac. Okay, this is this is really the most uh, essential diagram to, to to remember when it comes to trying to figure out what we might do with you um, before we sit down and talk. We have a processing technology that it, it, it actually stores the data um, where we allow you to import or read information into the brain without any pre-structuring or pre-definition relative to either the structure of the data or the questions that you might want to answer. Now there are some subtle differences between different ways you import it and what you might want to use with it. But you can literally, and I can do this for you live, take a bunch of text files right now and dump them into the brain and then look and see what I have. Much the same way you do. You don't get up in the morning and say, okay, I'm gonna process visual information now, launch your visual information processor, go, you know, if I'm gonna look at cars, I better load up the car library and remember because I've gotta put it there. You just get it, it just comes at you your brain does this marvelous job of filtering it and putting it in places and storing it, even though it doesn't know what you're going to do with it, when you're going to use it, how you're going to use it. You deal with that as a second step. This is really different fundamentally than a lot of other problems. And, and from a programming or an application point of view, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's freedom to you. Uh, because what you can do is you can get started with this, you can see how the brain sees your information, you can see the patterns and the anomalies, and you can explore that very quickly and very efficiently. Once you do that, then you can start to build the application. Um, we use some weird terms, and I apologize, but we, there was no such term for what we had, so we had to make one up, and so people give us a lot of crap about this. But our founder came up with this word, holosemantic. And, and what it is is simply a description of the container that we put the data in. Because not only do we process it and store it, but unlike a neural net, not only do we store it, but we actually keep track of where it is. Who came so, up with the name? So when you, I'm sorry? You said your founder came up with the name? Uh, yeah, Walt. Walt, D Walt Diggleman's uh, one of the co-founders. Not, not Monfred Hawkflies. He invents it. Walt thinks up really, really weird names for it. Um, and so if you go, on, you go online, you'll see Walt, he's our sort, he does this kind of thing all the time. Sounds very cool, he's got that Swiss English thing going on. Um, but it, but, but holosemantic data space is simply where we store the data. And so what we do is we, we use an XML overlay structure with handles and, 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 and a tree structure so that you can actually go in after you get an answer, you get a set of an associations or you see a pattern and you say, that doesn't make any sense. Why is it doing that? You can actually walk around inside and, and see how it works. Now we're going to see what happens. Okay, we're in. It's general purpose, and the reason that this business gets very interesting and, it, and, it, and there may be some relevance to you without actually being a semantic media wiki company, and I'm going to show you a demo earlier, is it's very general purpose. This, this technology is uh, at its core only 700 kilobytes. Um, it's currently a little DLL. It's, we're moving it into the cloud uh, a little bit later this uh, summer. Uh, so that it can address more memory. That's a sort of a legacy thing, but we do a lot of Java, Java applications and other, use other languages with REST and, and SOAP uh, interfaces. But it, being as small as it is, you can put it on a, 
everything from a smartphone device. You can embed it. You can put it, certainly I'm going to run it on my laptop. Um, you can put it in the cloud. You can architect it in whatever way your particular application uh, demands. So I, I, I want to just philosophically make a statement here. Um, we don't believe that in order to get to the singularity, if you're one of those guys, or to, to broad-based use of artificial intelligence, that you have to put everything about you, everything you know, and everything you want to build for one of your client applications in IBM server or Google server or the cloud and give it all up and ask pretty please to have a little intelligence come back. We happen to believe that the right tools in the right developers hands need to be deployed in ways that are used for the benefit of everybody the way anybody and everybody as an individual, as a developer, as an organization wants to use that capability. And so one of the things that marks us, besides being entrepreneurs and sort of being part of developing and growing new businesses, makes us biased against sort of an alternative approach. And we give, a, give you a technology that allows you to do some of that. Uh, we have some prototype applications that make this easier to understand. I'm going to show you AI Browser uh, and AI View. We have a prototyping app called Brainboard. These are things that come with the, uh, uh, with the SDK. Um, we are not the core of the application. We're actually a little piece that you plug in that makes it better. Um, in AI Browser, we actually did something that's a, a, a really uh, fundamental part of our development uh, work, which is to take our technology and mix it with other um, AI or other types of technologies to see where we have a value proposition, so see where we can address fail modes of existing pieces of technology and move forward. Um, I'm going to show you in a minute. We're uh, going to be named uh, next week in a report from Gartner as a cool vendor of the year award in content analytics. We spent a lot of time with those folks up in the business intelligence. Uh, space where the sort of new frontier is what do you do with all this unstructured data in combination with structured data? How do you make sense out of all that stuff? Um, and, um, and one of the, uh, the themes of, of coming from the Gartner analysts is that the real answers going forward are, are ensemble combinations of technology. That, that a lot of fields in different parts of, of, of computer science have moved as far as they can and they're running into limits and there's a plateau in the effectiveness and what are sort of moving things to the next ground are combinations of technology to address fail modes to, to get the right kinds of solutions. Um, I'm going to demonstrate this AI browser here um, right now just to show you um, that I'm not how much time do I have? That I'm not. I think all the way to ten o'clock. Okay, so that I'm not blowing smoke here, guys. Okay, so one of the things we did here to see to to, to, to create something that might be useful, and and um, and and this applies in particular, I think, uh, or can apply to to the Wikipedia, for instance. Um, I've got a lot of text. Here's a 10Q report. We built the browser plugin. Um, that allows me to take any document, um, get it up on my screen, um, invoke this little uh, browser plugin if I've got bandwidth and an internet connection. Yep, okay. So what it's done is it's, uh, it's scraped that particular 10Q, if a lot of you probably seen what 10Qs look like, um, and it's, it's created a set of keywords. One of the fundamental commands in Topic Mapper is it looks at a corpus either all the documents or one of the documents or a paragraph, and you can say, give me the keywords in that document, the most relevant terms to this particular section of text. Now, that works really well with our technology if you give it enough text to at least figure out what language you're using 
and, 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 and what terms might be most relevant. If you, if you don't give it enough text to learn from, it has a little trouble figuring out what's most important. So one of our problems was, we said, look, a lot of times you only have one document. Okay, now granted you can have training sets and thesaurian libraries and all kinds of other structure. We said, what, is there some way we can process and do this with one document? What we did is we took open NLP and we simply tagged all the words in the document so that we knew what the nouns, verbs, and so on were. We brought back our keyword command, a set of keywords, and we just filtered out everything but nouns. And we said, okay, that's interesting. What can I do with that? So what? Well, keywords are not anything special, for one thing, um, unless they're the right keywords. So what we think we have here is a way to get to the right set of keywords, to get to the unique essence of a document. And one of the simple things we can do, I, I clicked on one of those words. And what it does is it, is it summarizes the document. It shrinks it, just shows you that section. So if I'm a financial analyst and I'm interested in uh, how this company finances its business, it gives me a really quick, powerful, simple browser. There's some older people that have seen this that said, you know, actually the coolest thing about this is we just scraped the text off the website and displayed it in nice big white, or white on, or black on white times in Roman so I can read it, but, um, but that's not our value proposition. Um, so, so now that we've got this document analyzed, so I'm showing you down here that for each word that I click on, I also get all the associations. That's fundamental to our technology. So what do you do with that? One thing I do with that is I can say, all right, using the Google API, go find me documents like that document. So what it did is it took all of those keywords, and you can see the search string up here at the top. It used the tilde for a synonym. Okay, that's a ton of, that's a ton of keywords. I don't know, I doubt that anyone's ever manually entered a Boolean string that's that long to try and figure out how to find that document. But what's unique about this is the third ranking document, and this came back with about 32 documents that matched this set of keywords. Um, it, it's self-referencing, so it found itself. Now what's so special about that? Doesn't seem like such a big deal, right? I mean, except that if you look at those keywords, up here in this box, there isn't one unique keyword in that string that would allow you to find this document. Those are all general financial terms. What's, what's cool about this is the, is the unique combination of those words out of everything in the Google universe brought you right back within three hits of that document. So the power of that, and really that's, that's a concept to, to try and leave you with, is that there is a unique footprint or fingerprint out there. If you can you find, you get a tool that will allow you to find it, it will allow you to search for things across millions of documents and find a set of documents that have similar meaning. In this case, um, it's not hard to do. If I used WebEx, you would bring it right back because that's a unique keyword. So that's the AI browser. I did. I was trying to do something really clever here with Paul Allen. Um, you know, all, all this does. It, it, it here's a Wikipedia site. Um, you can uh, you can do the same thing with uh, with Paul. Um, it's a little bit tricky with sites like this to make sure that the uh, parser picks up the right stuff because you've got a lot of things going on on some of these pages. Um, some web pages have. Uh, some interesting um, in, encoding. I think our bandwidth is slowing down a little bit here, but um, but that's Paul. Um, if you go to Semantic Media Wiki, you can do much the same thing. And if you're you say, and here's where we're going with this from a product point of view, is that if if I find something, it's a fair. If I if I as a human, if I say to Tom over here, this broke. Can you go find me one of these? He'd look at that. Now he, he knows what a mouse is. He'd look at that and he'd say, hmm, okay, I'm gonna go to Fry's or, or, or wherever and I can, go, I can go get one of them. I don't have to tell him 
the, 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 the dimensions of this. I don't have to describe the color, the specs. I don't have to give them anything more than show them this. That's a very human thing to do. It's very intuitive. It's very simple. On the web, we've gotten used to being, being told that we have to ask our questions the way Google or the search engines, the way technology wants us to ask because that's the only way they know how to talk to us. What's cool about this, and, and it works for academic abstracts, uh, it works for financial analysts, it works for people, um, at, and, and this thing's locked up here. So we're, we're, we've reached some sort of limit, so I'm going to move back to my uh, presentation. But um, what it does is it allows you to do something very simple and intuitive as, a, as someone who spends a lot of time researching. You look at something, you say, I'm interested in this, what else is out there like that? Click, click, boom, and, you're, and you've got you know, some corpus that you can then explore, uh, crawl, download, and so on. Yeah? After this presentation, because you're going to show them time, would you be able to maybe give a demo of some of the other things you're going to show, maybe like during lunch or after hours? Yeah, yeah, a a a absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm going to stop pretty quick here because I'm not trying to commandeer the whole agenda for this thing because it, it, but it's, but it's, uh, it does get kind of fun looking at a lot of things, especially live. Um, uh, what, what is embedded also in that product that I just showed you is an export of that information, what we call the fingerprint, which is the edges and and uh, and, and vertices of the graph and the values and the direction of those relationships. And we can export that in a standard XGMML file. So in this case, we sucked it up into Cytoscape, which is a bioinformatics tool, and visualized it. Um, which is a, you know, if you've got seven or eight hours and you just want to lose yourself in stuff that's kind of cool, is you start doing that to documents and start trying to read these things and you find all kinds of neat stuff. Um, what we have here in this particular uh, uh, this, uh, slide is, is a, a comparison of the, an, the same news article as, as written by the People's uh, Daily, the Al Jazeera, and, and CNN. And, um, and you can do this in a lot of cases with different kinds of documents. And you can see writing styles. You can see the way a theme will, will have a nice consistent flow through a document. You can see when there's sort of some random statement or a paragraph that's not connected and it just has this, you know, a little bubble over here that's, that's uh, not related. Even though there's the same words in it, but conceptually it splits, which is uh, bias. interesting. What's that? And presume you can detect bias. When you get to the words, I mean, that's what this is showing down here, is you can actually see what words are connected to what. Um, it's, uh, it, it's neat. And, and that XGMML file is really significant from the standpoint of clustering or other kinds of, the purpose there was to allow you to do additional kinds of analytics on a corpus of documents or a particular document. So this visualization is very interesting. You've got colors, sizes, distance between the concepts, right? Mm -hmm. And also relationships. We will talk about more about that in the, your talk. Like how the how the how the visualization of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I mean, uh, and 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 Cytoscape, if you're familiar with, uh, we're not visualization people, um, and there's a tremendous. I mean, that's a whole field all by itself. Right. right. Uh, and so, rather than try to um, to develop visualizations, what we've done is simply we prototype and build interfaces so that people who want to do visualization can do it. And, and that, that we use that particular, that Cytoscape has, you know, like, you know, I don't know how many different layouts and, and all kinds of things that you can do. Um, that one is, we find, works pretty good for text, kind of showing the flow of, of, of a document. Um, this is a little bit, uh, this one's a little bit different, um, and, uh, okay, I'm okay on time. I want to show you uh, this one live. This is, this was the, um, this was the one that um, um, we used to, we used to give our PowerPoints and, you know, there was just a lot of people, you know, kind of suggesting that maybe we were full of bullshit. So, 
So what we like to do is we and we built this about a year ago is just show really raw, no no NLP, no nothing, really raw what the brain looks like. Um, what what this little Java program um, does is is allow you to take uh, a bunch of text documents, drag them from you know Windows Explorer, just drag the documents over into this box over here, um, and and uh, it converts them to XML, and then and then uh, dumps them into our topic mapper, which is the, the brain with no NLP, no processing at all. Um, there's a little bit of parsing involved. In this case, I want to show you that this is a really fun program to play with. But in this case, this is um, 7,600 tweets from last year's Semtech in San Francisco. So we took the file, and, and, and this was a, truly an experiment. I took the file, I said, I, said, I want to see if my brain can make any sense out of these tweets. And, and if you've looked at, here's, here's one particular page of the tweets. You probably can't see it that well. Um, here's what the parsed version looks like. The parser is not optimized for this. You can see it even tries to make these into documents and paragraphs. Um, and when you display in a large font size the keywords from the keyword command, it really still makes no sense. Um, key thing about our technology here, uh, relate, relative to what uh, you do in uh, Wikipedia, for instance, if you're trying to work with this and that kind of information. We do not know, our topic mapper does not know what language this is. It has no idea. It's completely language independent. It's looking at byte patterns. Everything in the topic matter, mapper API, everything between two spaces is a word. So you can put Chinese, Arabic, any language you want, you can read it, you can read data. Now it reads numbers as words, so it's not treating them as numbers with numerical values, it sees them as byte patterns. Um, the freedom that this gives you at the core is tremendous because underneath here you don't have to worry about what that data really is. Now you can't do arithmetic operations on it inside the topic mapper brain, you do that outside, that's something you do separately. Um, but in this case, what, the reason I can dump this Twitter stuff in here is because it's not trying to make words out of all this. Um, so what I, I did when I got to this, first of all, there's two steps in analyzing tweets. One is to trying to figure out whether what you're interested in is being talked about, or conversely, what's everybody talking about. Um, and, and that's a different type of problem. The second problem is, okay, once you've identified, you know, either your own brand you're trying to protect or, or a, a particular topic, um, then you want to find out what's being said about it. And usually, you know, um, at, at this point, you know, most of these things are looking for happy faces and sad faces. Um, uh, and, and so what I did was I said, hmm, okay, so... If I, I, I know uh, schema.org was a bit of a controversial hot topic um, at last year's Semtech. Um, so what I did is I, 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 I looked and, and said, what are the associations? What does my brain see when it sees schema.org? Um, and this is, this is how it visualizes. And this is the graph. This is, you're looking inside the brain right now. And you're looking at um, at two levels in the graph. So all, all this is is two levels and it's the most significant terms. So a significance, we return for every word, we return you, if you ask for associations, we return a value, um, a, a strength value and a distance value between two words. Okay, so you can use that strength value to threshold and, and, uh, and process. And in this case we said, well, let's just visualize those that have a strength of, of 100. And then let's go to each one of those words and visualize the associations for those at, at, at 100. And, and let's look at what that, what that graph looks like. And so here we are. The star in the middle is schema.org. Um, and all the big circles are sort of uh, endpoints of high relevance. Um, and then you get a few little clusters and things uh, off of that. Um, what, what I found most interesting when I first did this, and, and I've actually gone through and sort of looked at all the tweets that have these, these big circle words in it. Um, 
is the word bitch, which just didn't seem really appropriate to me uh, at, 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 at the Semtech conference, so it kind of jumped out at me. Now, Topic Mapper didn't do that. I did that. I said, you know, that word just stuck out. So I said, gee, I wonder where um, I wonder where that word is. Um, and so um, I could have looked inside of Topic Mapper and didn't. Um, I just went back and, and did a search on the corpus itself. And and what I found was that that the sentence or the tweet that had the word bitch in it was that people would rather bitch about schema.org than swap war stories. Which was fascinating to me because if you were at the conference, mostly what people were doing was bitching about schema.org. That actually perfect, you know, characterized the sentiment pretty well. Um, so for those that, that and I show this for two reasons. One, I thought that was pretty cool and it was just a discovery on my part. The other part was that a lot of people say, well, you're counting words. This is about word frequency. It's some sort of math or algorithm. And part of what we, we go to great pains to try to get people to understand is that this is not math. And one of the reasons it works is that language is not math. And, and attempts to solve language problems with formulas is doomed to fail at some point. You can get only so far trying to make humanity into a math formula. It just doesn't work. And there's lots of you know, catastrophes out there. Um, the, the landscape's littered with attempts to try and make us into physics problems. Unfortunately, we're irrational, we're ambiguous. We make words up. We change the meaning of words constantly. Um, bitch was used one time in 7,600 tweets. Schema.org was used 120 times. Um, and there was about 12,000 different words in those 7,600 tweets. So that set of dots there represents the relevance of, uh, and of the conversation around schema.org. Um, so we're building actually uh, this little graphic here is uh, we have uh, we have some we actually have some openings right now. Um, one of the uh, one of the candidates built uh, took that application and built a version of it for Twitter. Um, it's not fully debugged yet because it just was built three days ago, but, uh, or I would have shown it, but it was, uh, it was kind of the prototyping stuff that we do. We have a prototyping product uh, or, or a little app that sits on top of the API called BrainBoard. What that does, it allows you to, um, uh, to play with the command separately. So you import your data and you want to try the different uh, commands, the association, phonetic, um, the teaching commands and so on, and it allows you to do that. Um, our work is all over the place. Um, you can probably imagine that the government kind of folks, when you talk about being able to find associations across data sets of unstructured data, are interested in this kind of thing. Um, they're a real pain in the ass to work with. I hope I'm not offending any government folks, but um, it's not really our favorite space, but, uh, but there are some interesting problems there um, uh, that, that we're helping with. And in the case there, it, the most interesting part of it to us intellectually is that uh, the projects we're doing aren't, aren't working with unstructured data at all. They're working with log data, log analytics, and a, and a whole bunch of numbers, but treating them as words and looking for uh, the ability to do behavior uh, profiles um, of a particular device um, uh, with the, just from the communication traffic and then be able to identify when the behavior of that particular device uh, starts doing something uncharacteristic or unusual. Not really knowing whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, but just trying to follow those behavior profiles. So instead of a rules-based approach where they try and take every particular, you know, individual in the military and look at every particular communication device and say that they should be doing this, 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 and this, and then try and set a bunch of parameters. What they found is that's very difficult to do operationally because the behavior 
during a peaceful moment walking down the road out in Afghanistan is fine, but the behavior profile goes crazy when people start shooting. And so as the world changes, the weather changes, the location changes, all those things change, behavior pattern profile changes. And they wanted to make sure that they have the ability to kind of understand that with a much more dynamic sense. And this is where um, we're talking about emergent or complex systems as opposed to complicated systems. Um, we have a joint venture over in Berlin that's working on genomic sequencing, which is why I'm kind of, there was a piece of my keynote that said something about genomics. Um, it's one of the big trends out there. Um, I mentioned that we work with as, as, a, as a partner, um, and, uh, and so I'm going to skip through that. I mean. We win awards, who cares? Um, average age in here is probably about early 30s. Um, I'm than I look. What's that? I mean, I'm older than I look. <laughs> OK. So we'll go down to maybe 20 to 6, 29, something <laughs> like that. Um, this, this is kind of the reason I like what I do. Um, when I started programming on a TTY33 or TTY30, whatever that clunky old teletype thing, you guys probably have no 33. idea. 33. Thank you. <laughs> you're, obviously, you you're obviously in your early 40s. You don't, you don't look like someone who remembers 32. Uh, you know, I, I did. I, I, I thought the very first time I was on a, on a timeshare terminal on a CRT that it was the freakiest thing ever because there was no chunking or clicking or clacking. It was just kind of making squeaky noises and the green things were going across the screen. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you're writing programs you learn real early on. You know, my dad, who is a brilliant MIT guy, says, you know, that it only does what you tell it to do. Computers, you can you can want it to do something, but if you get a comma in the wrong place, you make a little syntax error, everything breaks. You know, it doesn't work, and you don't know whether where it is. You've got to kind of debug, right? And so we've gotten lots of fancier tools, and we made that a lot easier than it used to be. But um, but it still basically does the same thing. What fascinates me about this technology and what's fun working with it is as you <coughs> feed data into this brain, those associations change. It, it, it learns um, by virtue of that. Um, now, that's a broad statement. In any given application, what, what learning means is a little bit different because you have usually in an application, it's not pure data discovery. It's usually you're trying to build something that's useful to somebody, so there's an endpoint, a goal that you're trying to get to. Um, but the concept of, of creating devices that get a little bit smarter as you use them, so when I turn this thing on every morning, it doesn't do the same freaking thing it did yesterday and make me start all over. I got good, good you know, it, I read documents, it's bringing stuff in, no matter how it comes in, I read it. And I can maybe tell it what sources I like, but I still have to read those documents every day. It doesn't get any smarter. It doesn't read the documents for me and say, you don't need to read that document because you already know that. And, and that's what's really, really fun about this. That's Peter Drucker. You probably don't even know who he is. He was the sort of management genius guru way back when. Um, the way this works is it's, it's about listening. I mentioned that. Um, this is where I really want to stop. Um, you guys, you guys are, 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 are lucky. I mean, you've got, if, if I'm right about, eight, I mean, you've got a couple of decades to go. And God knows where we're going to be 20 years from now. I mean, uh, Ray Kurzweil notwithstanding. Um, but right now, um, there's some huge, huge forces at work that are about to change everything. And these, this isn't a, this is not, this is my own little list. This isn't for your benefit. It's not intended to be some, you know, magic formula. Um, but crowdsourcing, which you're right in the middle of, 
is absolutely fundamental to addressing a lot of what's coming at us. There's just no other possible way to do it. Um, big data, which is, which is part of what's driving the need for crowdsourcing, um, is, a, is another huge force. I mean, coming from, uh, from, from the Gartner Summit, the Gartner BI Summit a couple of weeks ago, I mean, the amounts of data that are coming at us and that are available are, are gigantic. They're presenting us with huge computing problems. All kinds of interesting things are going to change. The guys that figure out how to, 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 to extract value um, are, are, going to be, are going to be the next sort of, you know, sucker proofs. Um, mobile. I mean, there's already 5 billion, 5 billion mobile devices out there. Five billion? I mean, there's, there's, there, and, and, and there's only three billion subscribers. I mean, you know, how many people are in the world? I mean, for God's sake, this is that that that's an enormous number, enormous number. Gamification um, is really, really a new part of this. Um, I don't know if Ben Good's going to talk about his, his Gene Wiki game, but that's a combination of crowdsourcing and, and, and gaming. And, and I, I know in one of his slides here, he talks a little bit about um, Jane McGonigal's book, Bro Reality is Broken. But if you haven't read that book, you need to read that book. Um, that's, of course, you know, getting right to personal medicine and genomics, which is going to change medicine. Um, and, and what's a big part of all this trend is the consumerification or the, the, uh, the, the responsibility and the driving force behind a lot of this, uh, these trends going forward is going to be you and me and, and the consumer. The consumer is changing medicine not the doctors. If you've been in the medical business at all, one of the, one of the, uh, the sort of axioms there is that medic, medicine changes once a generation. You know, which sounds insane from a, for, for, from a, to a computer guy. But the guy learns it in med school, he knows what's safe, that's what he's been taught. When he dies, then the next guys can come along and, and start the new paradigm. The consumer is saying, screw you guys. I can go on Google and search what's wrong with me. I can go join a, a, a crowdsourced uh, study and, and find people with the same problem, and I can take control of my own, my own medical future. And genomics, of course, is really giving us that digital information that tells us you know, sort of what's bullshit and what's real, um, and, and, it's, and it's huge. Uh, but gamification is the one I want to I want to I want to leave you with because this is the one that I think is the most fascinating. Um, you can make fun of Ray Kurzweil and some of those futurists, but but if you have maybe you're all I, 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 show of hands. How many of you are gamers? Serious gamers. <laughs> okay. How many How many of you play games at least a couple hours a week? Any kind of game. Okay, see, okay, it's almost unanimous, all right? Um, that book is a must read. And, and the takeaway I want you to get from it is not only are lots of people playing games, but what she's done is she's looked at how games work, why they work well. Interestingly enough, Wikipedia is one of the best games that's ever been built. But games, Games suck people in, they get people to volunteer an enormous number of hours and an enormous amount of collaborative, creative energy. And so she studied that, and if you look at the tenets of game design, and, you, and if you've been to, to any kind of management training or even, uh, e even followed what good management practices are in terms of building organizations and putting people together in a group and trying to get work done. You know, you talk about culture and big goals and, and giving meaning to work and creating incentives 
And a lot of things that are the premises of great companies and great institutions and organizations, what she's talking about virtually online is the same thing. The practices of a good gamer, game, a good game designer, what he's putting in there, the structure and how he sets it up, is, is really the same thing that I learned from business. What's happening is, without even realizing it, we're all becoming gamers. Because you're not working in an office anymore, talking to people face to face, dealing with tangible stuff, you're sitting in GoToMeeting, you're on conferences, you're on Facebook, you're collaborating a lot of times with people you never ever even talk to. Who knows if that's a person? That could be an avatar some game designer created on the other side just to make you think that you're working with a person. It could be. Now, it probably isn't, but the point is as we move our lives online, and we spend more of our time on the WebEx and working that way, the people that are trying to accomplish things are the people and, are the, and the folks that are creating websites and creating collaborative workspaces have to look at the principles of game design for the roadmap to how to do this well. And the business people that are running businesses have to start thinking, I'm running a virtual company. I need to design my business like a video game. And, and, and as the, that's a, a force that's going to happen, and the reason I'm bringing it out to you folks is I think you, you have an opportunity here at this point in time with, you know, as I say, 500 million people for the first time in history online that you can listen to, the opportunities are, are, are enormous and the changes are huge. And since, um, since a, probably a bunch of you guys are using that, and, and, and if, if this guy told you this, you'd probably sit up straight and pay attention to him, but, um, but you just got me instead. But I really, uh, I really feel strongly about that. So, all set. Thanks. I appreciate your time. Anybody wants to talk more about AI?